Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. How dumb would it be for me to go out and put these pepper seeds in the ground and command them to be to, uh, potatoes? So what sense would it make for God to tell us to live holy lives if he didn't give us the seed of holiness on the inside of us? God is never going to command you to be something without giving you the ability to be that. First Corinthians chapter 5, 9 through 11. Paul said, I wrote to you previously in my letter not to associate closely and habitually with unchaste and impure people. Not meaning, of course, that you must altogether shun the immoral people of the world, or the greedy graspers, or cheats and thieves, or idolaters. Otherwise, you'd need to get out of the world and human society altogether. I love that. He's saying, you can't avoid everybody that's, you know, wicked and off the wall, you just have to leave the world. And you know, we want to remember that Jesus ate with publicans and sinners and tax collectors. But he's talking here about a difference in believers and unbelievers. Now listen to what he says. But now I do write to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a Christian brother. If he's known to be guilty of immorality or greed or is an idolater whose soul is devoted to any object that usurps the place of God or is a person with a foul tongue, railing, abusing, reviling, slandering. Boy, you guys are too quiet for comfort. <laughs> or is a drunkard or a swindler or a robber. No, you not, must not even so much as eat a meal with a person like that. Now, hmm, I don't know. I may have to get some help up here tonight. You guys are just like, whoa. Okay, now that doesn't mean that you can't hang out with a Christian that's living a wrong life if you're trying to help them, if you're trying to counsel them. But being around somebody enough occasionally to try to help them is a totally different thing than closely and habitually fellowshipping with them. And that I love that the Amplified Bible says you are not to closely and habitually fellowship with somebody because here's the thing. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping them. One of the reasons why Paul said to get away from people like that is because at least you're telling them, look, you can't live a double standard. You can't say you're one thing and live another life. I, that's, I don't want that. I don't want to hang out with a compromiser all the time. Please change. I want you to change. Click, keep praying for people like that. But here's another thing that we've really gotten good at in the church, and that's just putting up with stuff. Hmm. And see, ultimately, and you know, I care enough about you to stand up here and do this because let's just say that your best friend is a Christian who is constantly critically judging other people, gossiping, tail-bearing, complaining, murmuring, greedy, <laughs> immoral behavior. I won't even get into trying to define that. If you don't know what that is, go figure it out for yourself. <laughs> it's not good for you, and it's certainly not good for them to think that's okay. And we have to love people enough to say it's not okay. Please don't do that. Please don't do this to yourself. You know, the word sin means to miss the mark are the standard of God's, or God's standard for us, but it also means to sacrifice and to miss reward. And we studied it. I asked Pastor Mike to study it for me in the original languages. It means to miss the mark and to forfeit reward. And so really, people are just forfeiting, and that doesn't even mean that you might not go to heaven. 
I don't think that my holy behavior is what gets me into heaven, but I'll tell you one thing, there are gonna be rewards in heaven that I don't wanna miss out on. I don't wanna still be in kindergarten when I get there. Our pre-kindergarten, amen? Our sandbox, whatever that is. That's, that's even before pre-kindergarten, amen? Okay, let's see what else I can do to you. It's very dangerous to have a casual attitude towards sin. There are many things that the world, and I want you to listen to me, there are many things that the world approves of that God does not approve of. Man's laws may liberate us to do something that God's law does not liberate us to do. In other words, the courts can pass a law and say this is okay, or that's okay, or something else is okay. But if God's word says it's not okay, then it's not okay for us. Amen? And it scares me sometimes to see just what's happened in the number of years. I mean, just to look at what's happened in the world since I was a teenager, which has been a few years ago. <laughs> just to see what's happened since then, I can't imagine what's gonna happen in another 50 years, and it's scary because if we don't keep preaching these things to people and if we don't keep preaching them and then teaching them to our children and passing them down from generation to generation, I mean, it's not gonna be long and people are gonna really believe that wrong is right and right's wrong. We're already headed in that direction. And so I hope that we all get a little fire in our belly. And I'm not talking about living a legalistic life where you can't have any fun. I'm having a blast. But I'm pursuing God with my whole heart every day. I haven't arrived. I make mistakes every day. I'm not perfect in my behavior, but I want to be. And that's what God is after, a heart that wants to be. A wholehearted believer who says, I can't stand to be like this, God. I don't want to be critical and judgmental. I need your help. Help me. That's a bad habit in my life that I've put up with too long, and I'm going to study your word and pray in this area until you completely deliver me from this thing. Now that God can deal with. Amen? But what he can't deal with is acting like it doesn't matter. Amen? Amen? And you know, young people have such an opportunity today to set a standard for their generation. And I tell you what, if you're a young person in here, and by young, I mean, you know, let's just say 25 or under. I'm talking to that group of young, not that you're old if you're over 25. But, you know, I see different young people in here, teenagers and younger people, and boy, have you got a job on your hands. Man. I mean, you know, when I was in school, chewing gum in class was the worst thing that somebody could get in trouble for. It's a little bit different today. And we all can be a light in a dark world. I mean, people out there are desperate for help. They don't, you know, the world is so angry. And the more that society tries to get rid of God, the angrier that people get. And they're angry because we're not built by God to live without God. And so the more people try to take him away, the madder people get because there's no solution to any problem that they have. So they just feel totally frustrated. And we need to show them there is an answer. There is a way. And, and you know, I encourage you not to feel pressured to get out and preach, 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 preach to people. Just be a message. And then when they ask you, well, why are you so happy all the time? Well, aren't you afraid you're going to lose your job? Well, I'm so afraid of what's going to happen in the world. You don't seem to be afraid. What's, why not? Now the door is wide open to talk to people. We have to be the message. Just because they do it on television doesn't mean that it's permissible for us to do. <laughs> Hebrews 12.10 says that God disciplines us that we might share in his holiness. I love that. That's the whole reason why God deals with us. I'm so glad that God deals with me. I don't want him to ever leave me alone. Do you want him to ever leave you alone? I don't want God to let me get by with anything. I've got a scripture I'm going to share tomorrow night where David said to God, examine me, O God, and test me and prove me. 
I think that's a great scripture. God, come on, look me over really good. Pick me apart and let me know if there's anything that you see that you don't like. Make it clear to me and then help me change it. Test me, oh God, examine me. All right, well, what is sin? <laughs> well, it's what God says it is. And all we got to do is read the book. So why don't we just have a little fun? Let's just take the Ten Commandments. I heard somebody say one time, who in the world would stand up and try to preach on the Ten Commandments? And I thought, well, I think I'll give it a try and just see what happens. <laughs> you know, just because we've got Old Covenant and New Covenant, that doesn't mean that all of this is useless and that we've done away with it. It just means that it's been fulfilled in Christ. They had to try to keep the commandments on their own power. Now, we don't have to do that. Jesus gives us the grace and the power to keep them, but they're still just as real today as they ever were. I say to people all the time, grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy life. It's the power not to have to. God gives us his grace so we can do what he asks us to do. And that's a good thing. He puts a seed of being a pepper in me. Then he gives me the grace to actually become a pepper. You know, the pepper and the potato example that I gave earlier, the seeds. Well, if you missed that, I'm sorry. If you were texting then or, you know, whatever. We did. All right. Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> hmm. Number two, that was Exodus 20, verse 3. This is Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall not make unto yourself any graven image to worship it. And this is how people get sometimes. I know a woman one time that read this, and she was just like super spiritual. And she had this whole collection of these little I forget what, they, what you call them, but these little dolls and animals, these little ceramic things, and they were very expensive. And she read this, that you were not to have any graven image, and she threw the whole collection out, stomped on it, and got rid of it. It doesn't say you can't have a model of a bird in your house. It says that you can't have them to worship them. And see, that, that's how religious legalism can make you crazy. It's like all of a sudden now you can't do anything. We have to understand the heart of what's going on in the Word of God, that to worship it. And, you know, we say, well, no, I would never bow down to an idol. Well, can I tell you something? For some people, their house becomes their idol. For some people, their job becomes their idol. Anything that takes first place above God, that some people, their, their job is their idol. So we have to be careful about these things. Keep God first in your life. Don't bow down to any graven images. Don't use or repeat the name of the Lord in vain. That is lightly or frivolously in false affirmations or profanely. Well, I swear to God, if you do this, don't say that kind of stuff. We even need to get over the heavens and oh my God, can you believe that? You know why? Because we're not using God's name seriously and with faith when we do that. Earnestly remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Withdraw from common employment and dedicate it to God. Six days you shall do your labor and do all your work. Now, we could get really hung up on that unless we see what the New Testament also says about that. So we want to carry the spirit of the Sabbath with us. In other words, we can't work all the time. We need to rest, and we need to have time to honor God. But to be honest, we use Sunday, Saturday, it was Saturday in the Bible. So what difference would it make if it was Friday or Thursday or Wednesday or Tuesday night or Monday afternoon? The whole point is, is I got to have time for God. I have to have time for God and I have to have time to rest. And I need to have times where I draw away from work. We worship work in our society. And I'll tell you something, we are human beings, not human doings. Nobody is more driven than Americans are. And if we went and looked at Romans 14, verses 5 and 6, the Bible, where Paul was given instructions to people about things like this, he said, look, one man esteems all days alike. Another man says that certain days are more important than others. He said, basically, wherever your faith is it and whatever you believe, as long as you're doing unto the Lord, then that's 
than just do it. And for me, I would have a very difficult time picking out one day because God is my life. So I don't know how I could just pick out a day. And so I, I think that what we have under the new covenant is even much better than just taking one day a week. That To me, it's kind of like tithing and giving. You know, tithing is just practice for living the life of a giver. Anybody who has a problem with tithing, I don't know what you're going to do with the real spirit of love because God so loved the world that he gave his very best and his only. And so we need, if we have a problem tithing, what are we going to do when God asks for all of something that we've got or he asks us to really sacrifice something? We're not just doing great because we give a certain percentage of our money. God wants everything that we have to be available to him. He may not ever ask for it, but he doesn't want us to be owners. He wants us to be stewards. Amen. Well, we'll see who's courageous enough to come back. The next one is regard with honor Obedience and courtesy, your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God gives you. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you may live a long life. Now, I just have to say that my parents abused me, my father sexually abused me, my mother abandoned me into that abuse. But when my parents got up in their late 70s and they weren't very healthy, God told me to take care of them. You take care of them until they die. There was no reason why I would want to do that. It didn't seem fair. It didn't seem right. What had they done for me? But I can tell you right now, when we obey the word of God because we love God, we don't need to have any justification for doing what's right. We just do what's right because it's right. And if you have elderly parents that aren't doing well and you never call them or check on them and you don't do anything to help them, it is not right. And I know, you know, there's probably a lot of people watching my say, well, you don't know what my parents did to me. Well, I know what mine did to me. And I know the power that it added to my life when I obeyed God in that area. And I know, well, there's a lot of things that I know about. I don't have time to get into that. But anyway. <laughs> well, we know that God has told us to do something and we blatantly refuse to do it, we're just opening up a door for the enemy in our life, and we're giving up, but we're sacrificing a reward that God wants for us. God never asks us to do anything that's not gonna work out to be the very best for us in our lives. God has only got our best interest at heart. Everything he asks us to do is gonna work out good for us. You shall not commit murder. But then Jesus takes it a little further in Matthew 5. If you hate your brother or you're angry with him, it's the same thing as murdering him. Uh-oh. You shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says, but even if you look on a woman to lust after her, you have already committed adultery in your heart. Our ladies, if you look on a man to lust after him. <laughs> Woo -hoo. That's right, you can calm down. I've only got 10 minutes left. <laughs> Come on, we need this, don't we? Yeah. Good for us. You know what? You don't need to stare at all the underwear ads on TV. When those come on, just get your fast forward button and get beyond them. <laughs> I mean, I got to make it plain. When you get the underwear magazines in the mail that you didn't order, you know, you tried to order a toy and now you're getting 50 magazines you didn't want. Just throw them in a the trash can. Don't even, don't even bother flipping through them, especially not if you're a guy. Amen. Well, <laughs> boy, you, Paul, you ought to see some of the looks I'm getting up here. Do I get to come back next year after behaving like this? Oh.
I'll tell you one thing, you'll, you'll behave better next week. I don't know what else will happen, but. <laughs> you shall not steal. Well, that's one thing I don't do, thank God, Joyce. Well. <laughs> well, how about if you get paid for working a 40-hour week, but 10 of those hours you play on the Internet when your boss isn't looking and make personal phone calls? Back in Jesus' day, they stoned people doing what I'm doing. But it's the truth. You know, it's like, well, everybody does it. But you're not everybody. <laughs> you're not everybody. You're a child of the living God who has a seed of holiness and righteousness on the inside of you. You are a representative of the Most High God. And just because everybody else does it, that doesn't mean we do it. That's supposed to be the difference. Come out from among them and be separate. And that doesn't mean come out with a snooty religious attitude that I'm better than everybody else. That's the totally wrong way to be. Don't ever make people think that you feel like you're better than they are because you're a Christian. Befriend people that need help. But let's don't just live sloppy lives because everybody else is and act like it doesn't matter. You shall not lie. You shall not witness falsely against your neighbor. And the last one, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. In other words, that means you can't jealously want what other people have. We need to be content with what God has given us. Amen? I feel us growing tonight. See, we have to learn to stop thinking that if nobody saw me, it's okay. <laughs> because God sees everything. Everything. And the Bible says in Luke 12 that all the things that are hidden, all the things that go on behind closed doors will someday come out in the open. Amen. Amen. Now, what about what we'll call acceptable sins, <laughs> which there is no such thing, but one writer that I'm reading a book by said that we have respectable sins. So there are things that we don't even really think are sin, but we don't even, we don't even see them in that category anymore. Uh, so let's just take, for example, self-pity. Selfishness, laziness, <laughs> I mean really, do you really think that God invested everything that he invested in you so you could lay on the couch and eat donuts and watch soap operas? I mean, Jesus didn't die for us. God didn't give us all this wonderful stuff on the inside of us so we could sit around and do nothing with our lives but murmur and complain all the time. Come on, get a little fire. Gossip. And you know what? I went to church for so many years before God touched my life back in the 70s and really just set me on fire for him. I went to church every Sunday. And a whole bunch of us would go out to lunch afterwards or go out to breakfast, depending on which service we went to. And the whole thing was just to talk about everybody. <laughs> Gossip about the preacher. Did you see her? Did you see him? Well, so-and-so wasn't here today. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And I didn't have a clue that there was anything wrong with that. I didn't know that, they, you know, so it was, it was just an acceptable sin among our Christian friends. Well, the Bible says that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So just a question, are you wholeheartedly chasing after God? You know, the most fulfilling thing that we can do is to passionately pursue Him.
We're here at the Hand of Hope Medical Clinic in Angacha, Ethiopia. And Dave, I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you feeling as you come here and see the work that God's allowing us to do? Uh, I'm feeling humbled. I'm feeling thrilled, excited about what God's given us an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, when, when I look at this place, it was a rundown wreck at one time, and now it's so beautiful. The grounds are uh, actually, they say, they're therapeutic to the people here. Yeah, right. And uh, the people are excited about what, what has happened here. But we're excited about what God is doing, how he's helping the people here. And then gotcha, Ethiopia, we have the opportunity to yeah. help hurting people, and that's our goal, that's our desire, that's our hunger for, for Joyce Meyer Ministry. Well, one thing's for sure, we certainly love helping people and to see the smiles on the kids' faces and, and to see the hope in their parents' eyes is just a, a phenomenal blessing. I can honestly say, I don't think that there's anything in the world that's better or gives you a better feeling than knowing that you're making a positive difference in somebody else's life. I love to be able to put a smile on someone's face. Thank you for helping us do that. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash partner. Vind je het moeilijk om te bidden? Te ingewikkeld? Bidden kan zoiets moois zijn. Praat met God eenvoudig over alles. Een boek van Joyce Meyer kan jou hierbij helpen. De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed. Leer hoe je met God over alles kunt praten. Je kunt het boek De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed nu bestellen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch op 026 20 22 1 0 0. Een vervuld leven komt niet uit de hemel vallen. Maar het is zeker mogelijk, zegt Joyce Meyer. En ze laat je graag zien hoe je dat kunt bereiken. Maak kennis met Joyce. Met haar levensverhaal, met haar tips voor het dagelijks leven, met haar boeken en alle andere impulsen die je kunnen leiden naar een vervuld leven. Bestel gratis de informatiebrochure en bel 026 20 22 100. Of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash brochure.